All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to Kelly Fancher's thesis theater. Uh, my name is Robert Steed. I've been Kelly's lead thesis director this year. Our second reader is Dr. Larry Swain. And of course, there's Kelly, who actually wrote the thesis, did the hard work there. Um, we'll give brief introductions to start with, and then we'll open the field up to questions. Uh, like I said, my name is Robert Steed. I got my PhD from the University of Iowa in history of Asian religions, specializing in Chinese religion, but with a secondary focus in Japanese religion. I teach East Asian religions and cultures at Hawkeye Community College and the University of Northern Iowa. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Larry Swain. Hi, so I'm a medievalist. <laughs> so what am I doing on, on this panel? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I've, I've got my PhD at the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, specializing in medieval studies, particularly early medieval. Um, I had a special interest in this particular thesis because uh, I had a lot of illness when I was a kid. Uh, and one of the books that I read several times was Heidi. Uh, and so uh, I've never done scholarly work on it, but I have an interest in, in uh, people who do scholarly work on Heidi. So Kelly? Our victim yeah. of the hour. <laughs> yeah, well, um, professionally, I'm a software developer, and my undergrad degree was in math and computer science, so I really didn't start any scholarly um, academic interest in literature or language until coming to Signum, and so I've been working on this degree for the past eight years, and so this is the final milestone in that, I guess. Um, and then besides my professional career, I also volunteer at Signum, uh, working on the digital campus team, helping things run hopefully pretty smoothly there. All right, good. Well, I think a good way to start would be with Kelly just kind of giving us a bit of an overview of how he got interested in this topic, maybe a little bit about how he went about researching it, and maybe a couple of the major conclusions that, that he okay. developed over the course of the project. Yeah, gladly. Um, well, I guess um, my, I started thinking about thesis topics maybe about two years ago, um, as I was approaching the end of my degree at Signum, um, probably a little bit later than I should have, but still uh, started thinking about it. And early on, I pretty much decided I wanted to do something related to the works of Hayao Miyazaki, um, because I've loved Japanese um, anime since a child, especially the works of Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli. Uh, and I still wasn't really sure where I was going to go with that. I started thinking about things kind of a crossover with Tolkien's on fairy stories, but really I couldn't nail anything down uh, until one day by chance, as I was just reading a Swiss uh, website, um, I came across something that said that just Heidi, uh, in particular the Heidi, and, uh, Heidi Girl of the Alps anime was very popular in Japan. And so that kind of piqued my interest, and around the same time I'd also uh, discovered a book list published by Miyazaki of recommendations that he had that all children should read, and Heidi was one of the top books on that list. And so those things kind of combined made me start to think, okay, maybe I'll do something with this Heidi Girl of the Alps, which uh, Miyazaki worked on um, as uh, a scene director. And one of my main drawing to this is, as I said, since a young child, I've loved uh, Japanese animation, Japanese culture in general. Uh, but 10 years ago, I married my wife, who is Swiss, and so we've spent many years, uh, cumulative years, in Switzerland over the past decade. And I've just come to love Switzerland, its culture, and everything about Switzerland. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to meld uh, just kind of research into two countries that I love so much, both Switzerland and Japan. I wasn't really sure where I was going to go with that. I just knew I wanted to do something with uh, the Heidi Girl that Alps anime. So I started researching it in general and found pretty early on in it, um, I learned that the word nostalgia is kind of a modern word. It wasn't uh, coined until 1688, and it wasn't uh, coined in its current usage of kind of a longing for uh, something, a time or a place. Instead, it was a very specific medical diagnosis for acute homesickness um, and very deadly homesickness. And that kind of interests me a little bit. I'm like, oh, that's unique. Um, especially because kind of that dual fold nature of nostalgia, both the modern sense of evoking a longing for a past, often pastoral, um, is um, 
Heidi evokes, but also while in Frankfurt, Heidi actually suffers from this medical um, near deadly homesickness or nostalgia as it would have been originally. So I thought it was interesting that kind of this Swiss work is the embodiment of those two different forms of nostalgia that was in um, its originality a Swiss term um, coined by a Swiss medical doctor um, trying to diagnose all these Swiss mercenaries who were falling um, deadly from what was at the time called the uh, Schweizer Krankheit or the Swiss illness um, because it was so uniquely affecting um, Swiss mercenaries. And so I started digging into that, not really expecting this to be a thesis topic, but then um, I noticed that some people were saying that this um, nostalgia or this deadly homesickness was most frequently found in small, isolated, often mountainous communities. Um, so Switzerland, as well as the French Alsace region. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly or not. And so then that kind of like made me think, oh, well, you know, that description kind of fits Japan as well. I wonder if there's something there. I wonder if there's a connecting point of this love of Heidi in both Switzerland and Japan to that. Now, of course, my thesis took a little bit of a different direction, but that was the impetus uh, behind why I started to focus on nostalgia and homesickness uh, in Heidi in Japan. Um, as far as kind of the direction that my thesis took and the conclusions I ended up drawing uh, in the thesis itself, I started with kind of an overview of uh, the changing of the concept of nostalgia, starting back with its original um, coining in 1688, as well as over the next two centuries, how it kind of evolved and changed and became more literary in nature, and how it was so closely tied to the development of modernity and just kind of the loss of, ident of a cultural identity as the world became more homogenous, more so. Um, and Throughout that period, I noticed a common thing. Uh, most of the works I was reading about nostalgia were kind of European or uh, focused, uh, just because, I mean, that's where the word originated, so that's where they focused uh, their attention. Um, and so what I noticed is that as, nostalgia, as the uh, decades went on, nostalgia became more and more of more and more associated with a place it never was, um, because originally the nostalgia was homesickness for an actual place, one's home. Um, but as uh, society became more intermingled between different cultures, that longing for a home, um, that longing for a place, as generations passed, that place actually never existed. You, that was never your home. That was maybe your um, parents' home. And this became more and more so over time that um, nostalgia became a longing for a place that actually never really was. Um, and it became more of a utopian ideal of a place. Um, and that I associated with the German uh, term Heimat, which uh, has a lot of negative connotation over the past century. Um, but in general, it's just kind of the idea of a homeland and it's often utopian in nature. Um, in Japan, there's a similar uh, concept called the furuso <coughs> furusato, which uh, plays a similar role. And so looking at both of those, I just kind of came to um, describe nostalgia um, goal in modern society as being kind of a utopian impulse. They're looking for where a utopian place that never really was, um, but is where we kind of desire, the homeland that we desire. Now, so looking at the how Heidi, Girl of the Alps, the anime satisfied Japanese homesickness uh, ended up being the final point of the th thesis. Of like how does this anime in the 1970s from, a, from Switzerland, a European country, satisfy a homesickness or nostalgia for a Japanese populace that just kind of um, finished its entrance into um, the global age, um, reached kind of the tipping point of its entrance into modernity. Um, and, pardon me for a moment, just kind of yes. lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, Heidi relates to Japan's entering into the modern age. Yes, yes, yes. And, and so I kind of associated um, that and kind of looking at, okay, so what is uh, the homesickness aspect, the nostalgia aspect for um, Heidi Girl of the Alps? And I pinned it down on the utopian impulse in Heidi Girl of the Alps is, once again, this, what is its utopian pursuit? What is its home? And in this series in particular, and in actuality, most of Studio Ghibli works in general, it is childhood um, and kind of what we see in childhood as adults. And for 
um, Heidi Lee Ridley Alps, what is uh, especially spoke out to me was just kind of the affirmation of life that we see in childhood um, throughout the character, all the characters, but especially Heidi and kind of how she redeems life and the relationships with others uh, through her. And so that was uh, the main tip point. Then I went on and described um, several examples of how that is shown um, throughout uh, some em or emphasis that uh, Takahata and Miyazaki made in the series, as well as some changes they made to make that more explicit. Good, yeah, really interesting. I don't see any questions yet, so let me just play off what you just said and ask, um, what are some of those changes that you noticed that uh, Miyazaki and Takahata made in mm -hmm. the experience novel? Now, so going off of that um, root theme that I just talked about of kind of the affirmation of life, that theme is present in the original novel. Um, like Heidi, uh, one of the, the original novel is definitely more um, Christian uh, focused, um, like it is a Christian novel. It was often criticized as being a little too didactic. Um, and so that theme is present. Heidi does uh, save people in the Christian sense, but as well as redeeming them, um, like reuniting people who had been separated earlier um, be before the story began. Um, and so that theme is present, but Heidi of the Girl of the Alps emphasizes it even more. Um, there's pretty much not a single um, character or relationship that goes unchanged. Uh, the biggest of these changes um, happen to Frau Rotenmeier, um, who in the book is pretty much always portrayed, not evilly, but as overbearing, as strict. Um, there isn't really much love or value placed on her as a character. In the series, um, Heidi Girl of the Alps, we get that same behavior. Um, we get Frau Rotmeier is portrayed pretty much exactly as she is in the book, up until the point that Clara and Heidi, or until Clara um, goes to visit Heidi in Switzerland. At that point, um, Takahata and Miyazaki chose to make a major departure, and that was they sent Frau Rotmeier with Clara to uh, the Alps, which did not happen in the original novel. And uh, reading a couple of interviews um, that they did, one of the major reasons that they chose to do this is because they had shown Frau Rotenmeier as just kind of this mean, strict um, governess figure, but they wanted to redeem her before the series ended. It was approaching the conclusion of the year-long uh, series and they wanted to redeem her. And so they chose to send her. And early on, um, when Clara's like voice of confusion, like, why is she going with me? She's not going to like this. It's rustic, it's um, the backwoods, it's a mountain. How is she going to be terrified? Um, this is not her scene. She likes comfort and um, urban society. And um, her father tells her, well, that's because Frau Rotenmeier cares about you. She wants to take care of you. She wants to make sure you do well. Everything that she's done up until this point has been because that's how she thinks she's able to care for you best. She thinks she's protecting you. And so on, um, she's never redeemed in the sense that we see her like suddenly loving life and just a joyful person, but we do see her um, struggle with uh, the mountain life. We see her going barefoot. We see her wearing terrible clothes. We see her stumbling and um, barely able to eat the kind of the rural food all and covered in mud and all sorts of things. And just kind of, she's portrayed in a humorous light which towards the conclusion of the series when she is um, encouraging Clara to practice her walking and to get um, better, even though she's done it in this, it's done in a strict manner, which is her personality. We understand now that that is because she cares about Clara. Um, the other and perhaps the most major change in the series was towards Peter. Um, Peter in the book, he's, he's a likable character, um, but he's often portrayed a bit foolishly. And um, Takahata went a record saying, he, when he read the book, he thought it was kind of the aspect of a city person looking down on a country goat herd. Um, and he didn't want that. Um, this was a character that was going to be uh, present from the very first episode all the way to the very end episode. And he thought children were going to grow attached to him. They didn't want him portrayed in bad light. Um, in fact, at the very end of the book, um, Peter, jealous over his friendship with Heidi, is spiteful towards uh, Clara, and he just wants her to go away. And so he pushes her wheelchair, which she needs to get around, um, and breaks it out of spite, hoping that she would have to leave. Now, in the end, that ends up being the encouragement she needs to walk, um, but he didn't know that at the time. For the Peter that uh, Takahata and Miyazaki were portraying, that was just unthinkable. They, they couldn't do that to the character after having children grow so attached to him. Um, 
and have so much respect and love for him over the years. So what they chose to do instead is when Clara arrives, he, he's, he's shy, but he treats her with love. He does, he goes out of his way, he picks flowers for her and um, Heidi and brings them back from the Alps until, um, until they're able to go themselves. He builds a special uh, backpack chair that he can carry Clara up the mountains. Um, and so in the end, they end up getting rid of the whole um, Peter breaks the wheelchair scene. Instead, it happens on accident by Clara herself, uh, just so that they could emphasize that no, we're not we're not going to destroy these relationships. We're not going to have this antagonism in here. So we're going to heal them. Um, and so that those are the two major characteristic um, changes. Uh, but besides those changes, they there were lots of subtle changes throughout the series as well. Um, lots of emphasis on, like I said, restoring um, uh, relationships or restoring nature. Um, uh, pretty pretty much by the end of the series, there isn't a single relationship that was broken at the start or throughout the middle of the series that is not left healed. No, yeah, very good. I, you know, it does seem to me that Miyazaki focuses very much, right, on these kind of human relationships and how to make them work. So I guess it's not surprising to me that as early as Heidi, Girl of the Alps, he's already, right, playing around with these themes, as you pointed out. Let me take just a brief pause from my own questions and remind the audience that they can ask questions if they have anything that is like Kelly to um, respond to. Yeah, we do, uh, we do have some. So. Uh, all right, this is from Chris. Uh, and and uh, Kelly, you're not, uh, if you're not the first, you're one of the first Signum Thesis students researching anime. Uh, what were the challenges of researching anime on a scholarly level? Um, well, the largest challenge for uh, on a personal level for me was over the 10 classes I took um, in preparation for my thesis here at Signum, I had never done, oh, I, that's not true. I, I, did, uh, I did one um, paper on uh, Spirit of the Way, but that was kind of in my pre-research class, kind of learning how to do the research and how it would be structured. Um, but in general, I didn't do any anime focused or even um, non-Western culture focused studies. And so I just didn't really know where to begin. Uh, that was my biggest struggle, just not knowing how to approach this, not what journals to look into um, or yeah, where I could go. Um, and besides that, I, I don't know Japanese. And so that was also a struggling um, point at some times. And so my, uh, my, the, uh, the papers and research I had access to were more limited because of that. Um, as far as the nostalgia and the history side of things, a lot of that is published in English, um, or if not, I have a passable understanding of German. I could read German literature very slowly to pick that up, um, but for anything that was published exclusively in Japanese, that was just really not um, available to me unless I was able to pull out, out just small snippets to get those translated, but whole works uh, weren't available. Um, but you said Chris asked that. Chris was actually very helpful. Um, for this thesis, she kind of encouraged me to go this direction where I was um, talking about a couple of different paths. Um, she actually found um, a last year while I was in Switzerland. Um, I, I had a scheduled family trip to Switzerland for three months throughout the summer, and it just so happened that right around the time I was playing with this, there was scheduled to be a Heidi in Japan symposium at the University of Zurich, which was about a 40 minute drive away from where I was staying, um, as well as an accompanying uh, museum exhibit. And so that was a very good um, kind of jumping off point into this study, uh, because when I was going there, I was able to get a list of like a lot of names from the speakers there. Um, so I can look up some of their works uh, that they had done in the past or just get ideas on how to approach um, studying Heidi, studying anime um, or cross-cultural studies in general. All right, good. Uh, and then we have one from Sparrow. Uh, Kelly, I am intrigued by the Swiss mercenaries in 1688 having homesickness so acute that it became a diagnosis and received its own name, Nostalgia. Did you see any hints? Let me scroll down the box here. Did you see any hints in your research that this is related to combat PTSD? Hmm. Good question. That's interesting. I, I had, yeah, I hadn't thought about that at all. I and I don't. That's not not an aspect of human psychology I know much about. So I don't know much about PTSD. My inclination would be no. Um, just to give you an anecdote, this is possibly apocryphal, but um, in um, 
in reports of that uh, time period, uh, there, there were reports of um, them forbidding play the Kurahin, which is basically an Alpin melody to call cattle home or up to the mountains that they would play on elk horns or similar. And while the Swiss mercenaries were going out and serving in foreign troops, um, often French um, uh, French troops, the Kurahin was forbidden um, because the generals and um, all the foreign uh, military staff were saying that as soon as the Swiss heard these or heard cowbells on the Alps, they were just pretty much dropping over dead um, out of homesickness for Switzerland. And so it seems like it was actually occurring during um, their deployment instead of actually um, on return. And related to that, um, okay, as far as the time period in the late 17th century, um, it's been kind of studying uh, what researchers have determined is the cause for that is that during this time period, there were three major changes um, in serving under a foreign military rule. Um, the first was there was a rise of standing armies instead of just um, calling conscripts um, as needed. There were now um, standard fixed armies. Um, military service was greatly lengthened. And so it wasn't like the Swiss mercenaries were going out for a month and coming home. Um, afterwards, they were going out and they were away from home for extended period of times. And then finally, um, as part of the rise of the um, standing army, there was also a bigger effort placed on un uh, uniformity in the ar army. So um, common fighting um, tactics, uh, same weapons, as well as just a common uniform or military identity. And so um, that Swissness that the mercenaries felt uh, of being their own was kind of stripped away. And so that just kind of melted, made it feel like even more so that they weren't ever going to be able to return to their homeland. And so I think that was a greater reason that this just nostalgia, this deadly homesickness suddenly appeared where it wasn't um, in the hundreds of years prior that mercenaries, Swiss mercenaries were serv serving. Yeah, very good. I think my camera went off, but anyway, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. We can hear you fine. Okay. okay, yeah, and I would just, I think, add to that that, you know, after reading Kelly's thesis and talking with him about it, you know, there may be a kind of tangential relationship between PTSD and this and the kind of Swiss nostalgia, but it seems to me that they're fundamentally different in that, um, and see if Kelly agrees with me, but the nostalgia has to do with kind of moving away from home, and that can be experienced whether you've been in battle or not, right? Uh, it's just the leaving home that causes that, whereas PTSD implies that you've been in some sort of combat or very stressful situation, right? So, yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to speak too much on it, like I said, I don't know too much about PTSD, but that kind of brings to mind also um, that the PTSD does seem to be much more of an issue when you're back home, where nostalgia seems to be, like you were saying, the exact opposite in that um, Hofer, um, in his original thesis where he coined the term nostalgia, listed a whole bunch of these things that were actually affecting people, like um, um, just kind of stomach pains, ulcers, um, heart palpitations, unable to sleep, sleepwalking, um, lack of appetite. The big difference between this and PTSD, though, is as soon as the person was given hope, like that they were, they actually believed they were going to be going home. It was a near instant recovery. Mm -hmm. We do have a couple others, but this this kind of touches on on my current research, so I want to bring it up and see if we can make some connections. But I'm started a project on um, notions and uses of exile in early medieval culture. We'll say culture writ large. So I'm covering laws as well as literature and. Christian aspects and, and those kinds of things. If you're going into exile, which is considered to be a really serious thing, uh, you know, state to be in one that's very undesirable, what are you being exiled from? Well, that's the homeland. And, and it, you know, this, this whole idea of nostalgia um, seems very much the same. You don't want to go into exile because you're separated from home. And you want to get someplace that you can, you know, if, if not returning to your home, at least someplace where you can hang your hat and call it home, uh, you know, be under somebody else's rule or, or those kinds of things. Um, and so kind of, kind of what I'm curious about, and, and this is really kind of an unfair question to ask at this point, but I'll ask it anyway, um, right between the period that I'm working in 
right? Early medieval, late antiquity, early medieval, uh, and 1688. There's got to be more, you know, of that kind of feeling of of how important the patria is, right? The homeland uh, and that separation from that homeland, for whatever reason, um, is is something that creates a kind of trauma. And and I don't know how far back you look beyond, you know, the the coining of the term and, and its application to yeah. Uh, risk. Soldiers. That's right? also been something that I've thought about, um, but I haven't researched at all. Uh, my uh, research, I pretty much set a hard fixed point of the late 17th century, just kind of like the decade or two prior to um, Hofer's thesis, um, just so I kind of had a grounding point of why he saw the need to do this. Um, but I've also wondered, but I have wondered, okay, so we have this word defined um, in 1688. That doesn't mean that the concept or the this the actual effect didn't exist prior to it. Um, I just didn't spend much time researching it because I need to kind of focus my ideas, but I have been wondering about that as well. I think we saw it so much though in the late 17th century, just like I said, there were massive cultural changes that uh, made this a lot more prevalent amongst wide groups of people instead of um, presumably smaller, isolated incidents of exile, um, where now we were seeing hundreds of thousands of mercenaries or people traveling now in, in the starting of the global age. Um, but I, I am curious about that. I'm especially curious, um, like I think we might discuss later, but I'm really interested in exploring the concept of Heimat or the fatherland a little bit more and doing more research on that. I, I touched on it, just barely touched on it um, for this thesis, but that's something that I really want to study more to figure out like what is behind this concept, what is here. Um, and my preliminary research saw that kind of grow um, more and being discussed more um, during well, during the past 200 years, um, especially during um, the 20th century, when there were lots of um, people exiled from the German homeland, couldn't go back um, for whatever means, um, usually because of wars or um, differing beliefs. Um, but that's, like I said, that, that's just because there were these massive changes that affected wide groups of people. I'm sure it existed before that. I'm just didn't look into it yet. Well, but like I, I, I wasn't question. <laughs> well, for a similar thing, um, my research into nostalgia in Japan, um, because Japan's um, entrance into modernity was so much later than the West's, and it happened at, um, at such a condensed time scale compared to the West, nostalgia, basically, in, um, all research I did into nostalgia in Japan was kind of focused on the modern notion of kind of... Um, just a generic longing, not actually this um, acute homesickness aspect. Now, part of that is probably because I I, I can't do native Japanese um, research or native Japanese language research, and so that is a hindrance. I'm sure someone who can, um, can read Japanese could delve a little bit more into that. Um, but also, by the point that Japan enters, um, starts entering the global um, scene, nostalgia's definition has already changed. And so I, I'm thinking that this homesickness concept was there previously. I just, I'm not even sure where to begin um, because there is no, or at least I don't know the word for it um, in Japanese society prior to um, the late uh, 1800s. Yeah, and we have a question. I finally figured out how to open the question box. Um, we have a question from Sharon Hoff that I think plays off of what you were just, well, she wrote it before you spoke up, but it relates to what you were just saying, which is short of reading the paper, can you expand on Japanese homesickness? Is it a standard theme of Japanese folk stories? Now, given the fact that you know, you've acknowledged that you don't read Japanese, and Japanese folk tales were not like the primary focus of this thesis, Still, just at least within the world of Studio Ghibli films or other kinds of anime or Japanese literature that you did come across, how would you how would you answer that question? Yeah. Um, now, kind of playing off of like in my thesis, I kind of I focus on the homesickness aspect of nostalgia, um, and so kind of broadening that to look at nostalgia in Japanese literature in general, which is a bit easier for me to answer. Um, that is uh, very prevalent um, in literature of the 20th century. Um, 
Include, um, including both just uh, literature as well as um, Japanese animation or uh, films in general. Um, we see, I mean, in Studio Ghibli's work, oftentimes they take place in the past in often rural societies. Um, and there's a, a large emphasis on just kind of this um, idyllic home that is gone or is missing or things la uh, that are um, lacking. Uh, now that this thesis is complete, I'm looking forward to reading a lot more uh, Japanese literature, unfortunately, in translation for the moment. Um, just something I didn't have an opportunity to do before this thesis uh, because of time constraints. But uh, I, I was able to touch on it briefly, but uh, Natsume Sasuke, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, he wrote at the um, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, during this uh, just pivotal time in Japanese history where they were um, exiting isolation, entering um, the global era and just rapid uh, cultural transformations. And a lot of his works touch on this, just kind of this um, lack of a sense of identity. It's like, this is who we were, that's not us anymore, who are we? Um, and just, and so I, I'm looking forward to starting my uh, reading on Sasuke's works um, in general, but he, he does touch on it a lot. Yeah, all across his literature. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, what else do we have? Got a question from Mark and from Gabriel. So, mm -hmm. which one do you want first? All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, take one. So, from Gabriel, we have Howell's Moving Castle. Also, seems to have a Swiss landscape. Is that in? Is that accurate? Uh, do you know if Switzerland? was a long-term inspiration for uh, Ghibli. I probably um, I apologize. Ah, that's OK. Um, Howl's Moving Castle um, is uh, based on a Diana Wynne Jones novel um, of the same name. And so a lot its placement is European because uh, the novel's placement is European. Um, you'll see a lot of Studio Ghibli works um, take place in Western um, cultures. There are some obvious exceptions, um, like like we have uh, My Neighbor Totoro, um, Nus or not Nuska. I will, Nuska is completely different. Um, um, Princess Mononoke, I meant. Um, but a lot of the others do take place in um, kind of Western societies and towns, like Keith's Delivery Service, um, Heidi Grohl, the Alps, as we're talking about now, How's Moving Castle. I don't know as much um, that Switzerland in particular um, influenced his later works, um, but uh, Miyazaki, Takahata, as well as several others uh, went to Switzerland. Um, this was kind of remarkable for the time period. This was the first time a Japanese animator took a, basically went location scouting for an animated TV series. Um, it hadn't happened prior to this. And so uh, before they started working on the series, they took a two, I believe, week trip to Switzerland, um, toured Switzerland, got a feel for the culture, got a feel for the, um, um, architecture and all sorts of things like that. And so that trip certainly influenced his later works. And I believe he went several more times to different um, areas around Europe, um, not just Switzerland. Yeah, just to supplement that slightly, um, I, I don't know about Switzerland specifically. I, don't, I agree with Kelly. I think he knows more than I do about that. But Miyazaki in various interviews has said that for his anime that are set in a kind of generally European setting, uh, my camera went off again. Anyway, that's in a generally European setting. Um, it's a Europe that he thinks would have developed if there had not been world wars. So it's kind of a Europe without world wars and without those disruptions. Yeah. All right. All right, so we've got a question from Mark. Uh, what do you think are the most interesting changes due uh, specifically to cultural to culture differences? Um, well, I mean, the most obvious change um, due to specifically cultural differences is, like I said, uh, the original novel is very Christian didactic. Um, there. Like I said, um, one of its main tonal elements throughout the whole work is Heidi, the redeeming nature that Heidi has on those around her, um, but is explicitly through Christ um, and the Christian belief um, that that redemption occurs, um, explicitly so. Uh, Takahata and Miyazaki made the correct choice in saying, we're going to change this. Um, at, Christianity is just not as familiar to the average Japanese citizen, and so we're going to 
downplay this significantly or replace this with um, more naturalistic elements that would be uh, more familiar to uh, the Japanese uh, cultural upbringing. Um, and so they switched to focus on um, things that were more evocative of tri uh, tr uh, Japanese traditions such as uh, Shinto or Shugendo, which is an aesthetic mountain religion. Um, and so instead of like, Heidi, whenever she has um, an issue or is feeling down, um, she would, in the uh, book, she would sing hymns to um, her neighbor. She would uh, pray to God as she was taught to do from Grandmama in Frankfurt. That, that doesn't really happen in the series. Instead, she switches towards um, nature. And you see a lot of her, the kind of the revitalization of her life and her spirit comes from her interaction with nature. Um, so um, her interaction with wildlife, but in particular, um, her interaction with a, a, a trio of fir trees planted behind um, grandfather's hut. Um, there's uh, very often throughout the series, she'll go um, and she'll stand under them. And um, the narration tells us that the, the firs are speaking to her, the winds rustling through the firs and it's speaking to her, it's giving her encouragement. Um, and so it, it's to those uh, nature, na nature um, elements that she goes to instead of um, the Christian focus. And so that, that's the greatest um, cultural change. Um, besides that, there are a lot of um, re-emphasis or stronger emphasis than in the novel on things that would be more familiar with Japanese aesthetic forms. Um, so of course, the Japanese aesthetic forms develop completely differently than the Western um, world. And so they're just a little bit um, not appreciated in the West, it's just different. Um, and so uh, one of the main one of these is, that uh, most people are probably familiar with is Mono no Aware, which we're most familiar with through kind of the cherry blossoms, the sakura um, trees. And one of the greatest em our importances of this in Japanese society and culture is it's a transient thing. It's there, it's beautiful, but in moments it's gone. Um, and so this transient nature of life is very important in Japanese culture and aesthetic forms. And so uh, Takahata Miyazaki greatly um, emphasized that in uh, the anime. Um, so we see life passing and dying, seasons changing, and just kind of this transient nature of life is um, greatly emphasized. All right, well, I, I want to follow up on, on that in a specific way. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about earlier today, so therefore you haven't gotten this question, um, was about food in, in Heidi. So a cultural thing here. Uh, and one of the episodes I remember specifically is I, I believe it's Peter's grandmother who's ailing and, and is kind of in the background in several, in some chapters. Um, and uh, right, she, she only has, because they're poor, black bread, right? Rye, basically. Uh, but black bread and it's hard, and it's hard for her to chew and, and get down. So now after the Frankfurt Association, right, they, they send her white bread uh, and, and white rolls, which is much easier for her to chew. There are other food references throughout the Heidi novel. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just wondering how the anime handles those or if, if that handles them at all and just kind of skips over all of that. It, it does handle food. Um, I, guess, I guess just before going into this, um, in general, food has very um, prominent placement in most Studio Ghibli works. Um, like there is a lot of emphasis on food and what people are eating. Um, and so they, they certainly didn't um, neglect that in Heidi Girl of the Elves. Um, and so we, we, we see the same scenes. We see all throughout the episodes where Heidi is in Frankfurt. She is stowing away these are her white dinner rolls because she wants to take them back to her grandmother or Peter's grandmother. Um, and it's a big deal when they're taken away from her. And then in the end, Clara ends up sending some fresh ones with her because they would have been stale anyway. Um, and so it is a very big um, role, um, just as much so in the novel, um, perhaps even, I wouldn't say even more so, um, but seeing as how dining, ex except in um, specific literature, um, the dinner and the food itself is not emphasized as much as it could be in a visual medium. So it seems to be a even greater emphasis in the anime um, where there is times that's talked about in, this, in uh, the book where the anime, it doesn't need to be talked about all the time except for the obvious bread roll um, incidents. Um, it's just shown, it's visualized. Um, the one area where it is different, which 
Okay, you, you, I mean, Miyazaki and Takahata, they do have to play up cultural stereotypes. Um, they, they clearly depict the cheese. It, it's holy cheese. It, it's Swiss Emmentaler cheese, which <laughs> Heidi would not have eaten, but there's holes in it because the Japanese expect there to be holes in Swiss cheese. Um, so that, that's really the only major change. Uh, and to Kako notes, I remember kids excited with Heidi's white bread. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we've got a question from Sharon. Uh, I realize this does not relate to your paper, but uh, now I can't get the parallels between Heidi, Pollyanna, and Anne of Green Gables. Any thoughts? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> but I've actually, I've been thinking about that. Um, there is an Anne of Green Gables anime. I don't believe... Um, Miyazaki didn't, he may have worked on like the first couple of episodes on the Anna Green Gables. As a little bit of background, um, Heidi Roll the Alps was really the first um, of these kind of adaptations of a Western classic into a, a television series. And this became a common thing called um, World Masterpiece Theater in Japan, which aired for, I believe, 40, 50 years straight. Um, they, they would do Heidi Girl the Alps, they would do something else. I think Anna Green Gables was next in the series. Um, and, and so, I'm really interested in going back and watching all these when I have time and just kind of seeing what choices were made between all, um, all of the um, all these different series. But we, uh, my wife and I just recently watched the, um, the Pollyanna film, um, the one from the 50s, maybe. Um, and I just something that completely separate from this thesis topic um, in my mind is just like these um, orphan girl literature. Um, the orphan child girl is often portrayed in a very just kind of like high spirits, um, full of life, redeeming nature. I'm just, I, I haven't thought about this at all, except that like, oh, that would be something interesting to look into. I'm um, just kind of a comparison between these three and just kind of the um, cultural time period which they arose. Like, like what is there about that? that give rise to this um, idea of a little orphan girl changing the world around her because of her upbeat um, spirit and love for life. David Copperfield. Yeah. <laughs> What's the one on the, uh, the artful dot? Oliver Twist. Uh, there we go. Right, two male orphans by Dickens. But, mm -hmm. but if set in darker circumstances, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. the same idea of the orphan who uh, rises above the circumstances because of mm -hmm. positivity and, mm -hmm. luck and changing the, the people around them. Uh, mm -hmm. for the, but yeah, but, well, <laughs> and Chris, yeah, it also fits with the theme of nostalgia, right? Yes. In a sense, because in modernity, if we follow this logic, we're all kind of orphaned, right? We're all cut off at, at some level from our roots, so the theory goes. So to have a protagonist that's an orphan serves as a kind of effective stand-in for the rest of us, right? Mm -hmm. And then Chris uh, just says, anime, <laughs> big exclamation point. Oh, Brenton uh, has, has <laughs> come. let's see what Brenton, Brenton's got here. Uh, Kelly, thanks for the great presentation. I was pleased to see uh, a bit of it before you dug in. If you do develop the Anne of Green Gables links at the Ellen Montgomery Institute here in Prince Edward Island, we would love to see a paper in the Journal of Ellen Montgomery, Ellen Montgomery Studies. Our conferences uh, often have presentations from Japan and Europe, or presenters, presenters from Japan and Europe. All right. Yeah, on, on, on that um, topic, I, I just kind of in offhand discussions, um, just kind of side discussions with Brenton that I've had, um, like apparently, Prince Edward Island does have a large number of Japanese tourists um, because of um, Anne of Green Gables. The same is true of Switzerland, um, largely because of the Heidi Girl the Alps series. Uh, Switzerland, um, Heidi Dorf, the, the kind of like the area does, um, that takes place in Switzerland and is now kind of a small uh, village kind of um, just experience where you can go and experience Heidi uh, because of this anime series they have a huge influx of uh, Japanese visitors every year and um, the series has largely changed the landscape there as well um, like a lot of the signs and posters you see there are from characters from the anime um, not previous illustrators it's the anime depiction of Heidi that you see there well along those lines how popular is the anime series in Switzerland <laughs> um, 
<laughs> or is it? As far as I know, it was never released in Switzerland. Um, probably because it's Switzerland. They're like, oh, this is our Heidi. I, I'm okay. I'm just spitballing here. Um, I, I'm not gonna go there. Um, I, I don't know why. Um, as far as I know, it was never released in Switzerland, and so I don't think there is that um, um, exposure to it. However, the surrounding countries, Germany, it was released in Germany. Um, I have, I, I've talked with a number of people, um, colleagues kind of mentioned, hey, this is what I'm doing. And they're like, hey, I watched that when I was younger. And, and these are from countries from, from Spain, uh, from Guatemala, from, from all over um, the world. It's like, oh yeah, like I, 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 I knew that, um, I, I love that growing up. Or it's like, yeah, that was always on, um, even if they didn't enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so the Heidi Girl, the Elp series was very popular. I'm just not sure about Switzerland itself. One thing I, do know is I believe it was all um, original um, composed music um, for the Japanese version. I don't know about the German version, um, but the opening theme song for uh, the, uh, the German uh, dubbed version, uh, which I've been watching with my wife and children, um, just extra chance for them to learn German, um, as well as just kind of something fun to do. Uh, my wife is like, oh, I know that song. So the song, the theme song plays everywhere. Like we were skiing and your one's like, yeah, that, that's the song from Heidi. Um, so she never saw the anime. Um, and I'm not sure if the song existed before them, but I think it was written for the series. And so it, it does touch on um, the culture, but I don't think it was ever actually released there. Yeah, I think I might be wrong about this, but I think it was the first shoujo series to become popular around the world. And my wife, um, who grew up in Mexico, says it was, I think it was the first, you know, Japanese thing that she had ever seen growing yeah, up. Yeah, and a lot of people uh, in who, who've who written essays or just kind of reflections on it um, wrote, and they were like, I, I didn't know this was Japanese, um, just because it was yeah. so... I, I I don't want to say so well done. It felt felt so European. Um, it felt so real of their experiences that they didn't realize it came from Japan. Um, and yeah, on that point, it was extremely popular. Um, I think it was released in 35 countries worldwide in over 20 languages. Um, in Japan, I I think up until recently it had it had been airing pretty much nonstop um, since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, in a 2009 survey, it was voted. Um, the most popular anime amongst uh, female viewers. And that was four decades later after release. Um, so, so yeah, it was very popular. So just a general question that I'd like to ask you. So over the course of your research and writing this thesis, what kind of thing did you discover that was the most surprising for you, maybe the least expected? Um, well, I, the most, I, I mean, the very first thing I discovered is probably the most surviving, and that is that apparently in 1688, people were dying of homesickness. Like, like that, and like <laughs> cowbells were forbidden from being on military cattle because they thought it would kill the Swiss soldiers. And so that was the most surprising, the most shocking. Um, but beyond that, and this might be cheating because there's nothing spe um, specific about this thesis in general. Um, but the more widely I read or study, I'm just kind of learning how interconnected everything is. Like in, in undergrad or in high school, when learning about history, you, you get this very narrow track, understandably, because you have a limited time, um, but you get this view of things. Um, but then each new thing I learn, like the study into Heimat or um, nostalgia or um, Japanese entrance into modernity, it's like that touch on so many different things throughout the history um, that I never knew before. Um, like the Selja played a very large role in French col um, colonization efforts in Africa, which I didn't know. Um, and so I think that was my greatest um, revelation here is just how much um, theoretic and philosophical thought of nostalgia over the past two centuries, three centuries at this point, um, has touched into the development of Western society as we know it. Um, and as I'm sure about just about pretty much everything, it just, yeah, I just love seeing that and just how everything is interconnected and influences in some way or other. Yeah. Great, we've got a couple of, uh, of things uh, in the offing. So Takako says, uh, I heard Heidi anime has been popular in European countries like France. The story goes that a girl from Japan uh, 
uh, went to somewhere in Europe, had friends who didn't believe it's a Japanese anime. So just kind of confirming uh, yeah. what mm -hmm. you're saying. Uh, and then Sparrow says, Kelly, I have a beginner question about anime. I know there's an iconic uh, art style. Are there iconic or necessary themes which are explored or uh, explored by or appropriate to anime? I, at this point, anime in general has become a, a medium more than anything else. There are so many different um, themes, uh, themes discussed, themes um, examined. Um, as well as different art styles. Uh, there are very vastly different art styles. If I was to try and pinpoint just a couple of things, I think one thing that seems pretty standard, um, which once again you you will find exceptions, is just um, just the vibrancy and just how emphatic and um, how overdone emotions and reactions are uh, to things. That seems to be pretty typical of um, Japanese anime. Uh, which makes a wonderful um, vessel for exploring uh, this thesis is because a lot of the tones, uh, tonal elements that were in the book of Heidi's emotion and, and just kind of her, her relationships with others as well as um, the pain she was feeling uh, while in Frankfurt missing um, her home, in the anime they're way over embellished and over dramatized, which is out of place on one hand, but because it's anime, it, it doesn't feel out of place because that is just so common. And that allows a greater, um, seems exploration of kind of human emotion um, than is possible in just kind of say set film um, or a traditional Western cartoon or animation. Okay. Uh, other questions? things you'd like to observe? Well, I'll ask another one then. So in your title, you talk about Heidi as being a site for the alleviation of Japanese nostalgia. And you've kind of talked about that a little bit, but it's you haven't talked about it directly yet. And since it's in your title and the abstract, uh, could you just say a few words about what you mean by that? How do you see Heidi working to both as a site for Japanese nostalgia and working to alleviate it? Yeah. Um, well, what, like I was saying, um, throughout uh, the early uh, 20th century, Japan underwent a pretty radical transformation um, that was greatly exacerbated by World War II um, and foreign occupation on Japanese soil, which left many people leading up to the 1970s just lost uh, main japanese uh, just just lost feeling like okay like where's japan like well, what is my identity where is home um and like i said this came to a head in 1970s because besides uh, those changes there was a lot of uh, economic scandals and corporate corruption as well as environmental disasters um and so then here comes heidi girl the alps the anime and it portrayed a a, a European um, rural society, but in such a way that it was, it, I, no Japanese viewer is watching it and saying, oh, that's Japan a hundred years ago, but it's evocative of Japan, okay? The mountainous um, setting of um, Heidi's village, that's evocative of mountainous Japan. Um, the small rural farming, um, Isolated village is um, evocative of um, smaller um, villages in Japan pre-urbanization. Um, and so there's that aspect of the modern aspect of um, nostalgia, the homesickness. Um, it's, it may not be a historically accurate Japan, but it is evocative of the same Japan that many felt were missing, um, especially in the 1970s as urbanization was on a huge um, uh, uptick in Japan. Many were just um, traditionally homesick or nostalgic for an idyllic countryside. Um, and Heidi Roll the Alps demonstrates that in spades. Um, besides that, like I mentioned earlier, um, Miyazaki and Takahata went through great efforts to try and make it even more relatable to uh, Japanese viewers in um, kind of lower key. Well, okay, not all lower key, like like the um, Christian to kind of naturalistic um, change. Um, that would make it more relatable, to feel more um, understandable for a traditional Japanese viewer. Um, same thing, like I said, um, emphasizing um, already existing, but emphasizing the Japanese aesthetic forms that were in the original novel. 
um, just kind of like the passing of seasons or um, the withering of life or flowers. I mean, they're, they're here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and so that kind of focus on things like that also helps to make it um, more relatable to Japanese viewers. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, not, not seeing any. I don't see any either. So, well, just in general, <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to say prognosis go ahead. for the future, right? I mean, you're what, 50, almost 50 years old, at least 40 years old, right? The, uh, our anime. Uh, and we've had some, you know, the world classics that you mentioned and so on. But, but the, you know, is there a future for doing this kind of nostalgic um, production, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, in the future, right? I mean, we're kind of a, a, in, in a, we're kind of repeating 50 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> do we need a new Heidi? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure about anime in particular, um, but Susan Napier, who's a uh, Japanese literary scholar, um, well known for her anime studies, but also Japanese literature in general, um, looked at Japanese literature throughout the 20th century. And she found that um, th there were a change in um, focuses on topics, which is understandable. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, um, like a lot of the world, um, topics changed from kind of focusing on a utopian society to more a dystopian society and kind of doom and gloom, um, which we've also seen the same thing happen in anime. Um, like post-apocalyptic uh, themes are very common in anime now and, and just kind of, um, as far as we go back to kind of this nostalgic, I'm sure that there will always be some of it. I, I can't predict what will happen, um, especially in the current um, world situation. But I think it depends on the creator themselves. Um, Miyazaki and Takahata, they, they, grew, they were born in the um, early four, late 30s, early 40s. Um, they, they, they lived through this. Um, so they experienced firsthand this loss of identity, this changing world. And they, throughout their entire career, um, their emphasis has not been on doom and gloom. It has been on just kind of the hope, uh, life, um, and just kind of savoring and cherishing life. Um, whereas other anime um, creators, that isn't as important a topic. I would certainly say that living through um, this time period now, there will come a time period when somebody's like, okay, yeah, I, I, I don't like this change. Let, let's refocus on happier um, memories and look back at a past that maybe never was, but should have been. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm certain we'll see that. I can't say when we'll see that or from whom it will be, um, but we will see at some point. All right, good. Well, we've got a few left comments here from folk. Uh, Takako says, great, and then follows that up with, maybe we need these kinds of stories. Uh, we have been so away from nature, even just looking at things in nature. But now coronavirus, people now have lots of time uh, for gardening and such, perhaps. So, yeah, I, I think we need these kinds of stories. Um, and then uh, Chris says, congratulations, Kelly, looking forward to reading your thesis. All right, that's all I've got. So, so uh, Robert, do you have anything else? No, I think that was really uh, well done. Really, I'd like to thank Kelly uh, for doing this and for inviting me to be his thesis director. I've enjoyed this year working with Kelly and kind of seeing how this project unfolds. Um, so, I wish Kelly the best and I also, I'd like to thank Signum for inviting me to do this as well. And thank you, Larry, for serving us. For my my very great pleasure. Awesome. So, thank you for asking me, Kelly. So, yeah, well, and I also um, want to thank both of you for um, being my uh, director as well as second reader. You've both been very helpful uh, throughout this journey, very encouraging. Like I said, this is not my background. So, um, every interaction I've had with um, you two or from all of my uh, all the faculty at Signum has been a wonderful blessing. It's just encouragement for someone who has felt greatly out of place in this um, group of people. <laughs> well, you've done very well. So congratulations. Yep. yep. And Maggie, Faith, and Sharon all send their congratulations and applause. So. And thank, <laughs> thank you to you our audience. 
And so for those who watch this and ask questions or just observed, thank you. You know, this is supposed to be a conversation with an audience. Without an audience, that's not possible. So thank you.